Rabbi Avraham Yitzchak HaKohen Kok was born in 1865 in Griva, Latvia. As the scion of a Hasidic family on his mother's side and a Lithuanian family on his father's, he studied with outstanding rabbis of both major Ashkenazic Jewish movements. He was quickly recognized as a prodigy and sent to study in the finest yeshiva in Lithuania, the yeshiva of Volozhin. Rabbi Naftali Tzvi Berlin, the Nitziv who headed the yeshiva, said of the young Rav Kook that it was worthwhile establishing the Volozhin yeshiva if only to teach a student like him. At the age of 30, he was called to serve as rabbi of the city of Boisk. Already then, he was revered as a leader able to integrate sacred study with public leadership. His vast wisdom and courageous rulings on day-to-day -day matters drew the eyes of all the communities in Yeshivot of Europe to him. But the Rav's heart was drawn to one thing, Eretz Yisrael, the Holy Land of Israel. His early writings represented the initial stages of the teachings that would later serve as the engine of a national revival movement moving forward on the tracks of the Jewish heritage. One hundred years ago, the Jewish leadership in Eretz Yisrael invited Rav Kook to serve as the rabbi of the city of Jaffa and surrounding agricultural communities. The Rav did not hesitate and set out upon a path that would shape the face of Judaism in Eretz Yisrael for many generations to come. It is difficult to determine how Rav Kook realized that the time had come. All we know is that he had wanted to come to Eretz Yisrael a long time earlier, but his father-in-law told him not to, that he shouldn't come as a private individual. He published his books under his own name, and in Eretz Yisrael the residents of Jaffa, at the time a tiny city, saw them and said, this is the rabbi for us. So they brought him from far off Lithuania all the way to Jaffa. The first article he published in Eretz Yisrael after he came was Hador, The Generation. That was his introductory article, The Generation. Before that, he also wrote very great things. But when he arrived in Jaffa, everything rose to an entirely different level. If we penetrate its inner essence, we find that this is not a base generation, nor is it, in truth, a generation of sinners. Let us prepare for it a path, so that it may find what it seeks inside the borders of Israel. We will not deprive it of the good light. We will radiate upon it the light of life with the light of truth, which illuminates from the source of the Jewish soul, and our children will gaze upon it and be illuminated by it. He describes the generation in all its complexity. It is a generation in which everything is large-scale, a great thirst, great yeshivot, great idealists. But it's also a generation of smallness, great crises, a great decline. To develop the spiritual strength of the Torah, which is in every Jew, that was the goal, to bring the voice of Torah into Eretz Yisrael. That is when the attraction to Eretz Yisrael began, and the attraction to Eretz Yisrael is connected with the Torah of the Jewish people. The immigration to Eretz Yisrael, and the building of Eretz Yisrael, and the building of these kinds of places, that in itself is a messianic act. That was the great innovation of the students of the Vilna Gaon. That is what Rav Kook continued, but he had to accomplish it in a modern reality. As soon as he arrived, he launched his campaign to sanctify the secular and mundane. Rav Kook made every effort to renew and strengthen the bond between the nation and its heritage. He established religious schools for children and the general public and forged strong ties with the Zionist leadership. Rav Kook wrote numerous articles on all areas of Judaism, particularly on commandments that can be fulfilled only in Eretz Yisrael. He worked to endear those commandments to the Jewish farmers. The first generation in the era of redemption, and the beginning of the resettlement of Eretz Yisrael, is preparing the ground for the Jewish people. 
and the spirituality should serve in it only to preserve the inner life. And when the material strength of the nation becomes stronger, then all the sacred spiritual qualities in it will be revealed, and the Torah with all its light will return in all its strength to be a light unto the world. Rav Kook had a unique attachment and love for the Jezreel Valley because he viewed it as the realization of the practical Zionist vision. For him, the valley was a dream come true. To view Zionism as a messianic process, I've lived in the Jezreel Valley for 80 years. I never heard that expression used by our parents even once, that it was a messianic process. That is, that there is a superhuman process at work here. They considered it a revival process. Here they planted and sowed and so forth. For them, it had a different meaning, not a religious, mystical meaning, but rather a concrete, practical one. Perhaps for Rav Kook, this rebuilding of the land was a genuine solution to a very intriguing question. The abstract, spiritual and mystical aspects of it could be detected with the senses, with the eye, by hearing and so on. And here the Rav saw, almost without any awareness on their part, without giving it a name, values being realized, values on the ground, for real. Some aspects of perfecting the world cannot be carried out by the pious, but only by godless people who are deficient in knowledge and deeds. These acts of perfecting, including social perfecting, such as tools to cultivate the land, wars, practical inventions. And there are also acts of spiritual perfecting that involve certain practical aspects and knowledge whose necessary details the soul filled with piety and a yearning for sanctity cannot deal with. There was criticism leveled at Rav Kook when he came to live in Eretz Yisrael at the start of the rebirth of the state regarding the way he related to the builders of the land. At the time, they may have been remote from the Torah, but Rav Kook saw the good in them and respected the fact that they were the builders of Eretz Yisrael. Rav Kook used to come here. Where did he pray? You have to understand that perhaps for the first time in the history of the Jewish people, settlements were being built here in the Holy Land without synagogues. These young people were rebelling against life in the diaspora and its traditions. And because they were young, their rebellion was all-embracing. Many of those in Ein Harod were Torah scholars. They were people that knew, that had studied, and they decided, and I assume the same was true in Geva, that we would create something different, something new. Without that rebellion, the entire endeavor might never have happened. One doesn't have to view every new phenomenon, even if rebellious, as contradicting our entire path, not necessarily. Aliyah to Eretz Yisrael has a characteristic of newness. Even our forefather Abraham wanted to be a new person. Abraham brought about a revolution of faith. These rebellions are entirely different, yes, definitely. There is no similarity, but there is a common denominator. The rebellion against the diaspora, a rebellion against idolatry, a rebellion against his father Terah. This wave of emigration rebelled against what it thought was obsolete, not right. Even out of the profane will the sacred be revealed, and even from license and permissiveness will come the beloved yoke. This will be the supreme marvel of the vision of redemption. The fruit will ripen and the whole world will know that the Divine Spirit speaks through the Jewish people with every movement of its spirit. The Jewish people is involved in a process of maturing. They're returning to their land to become independent. So they're rebelling against what existed before. They want a new character, so first they must replace the body. During puberty, a person's body changes and grows very rapidly. And that comes at the expense of the spirit. And when we finish the existential, physiological process, we'll work on the spiritual part. During that period, it was difficult to see it. Look at Bialik, who came to Israel and somehow remained connected to Jewish tradition. And Beryl Katzenelson, too. They understood that it couldn't all be left behind. 
perhaps some of the pioneers didn't understand this, perhaps most. But the very fact that the settlement endeavor should have been based on Jewish tradition, that was elementary. But Rav Kook was not satisfied only with bringing Jews that had abandoned the heritage of their fathers closer to the Torah. In 1914, when he was invited to a conference of Agudat Yisrael to be held in Germany, he viewed it as an opportunity to present his worldview and the justice of his support for Zionism to the diaspora leaders of world ultra-Orthodox Jewry. Unfortunately, he left Eretz Yisrael unaware that World War I was about to break out and keep him from returning to Eretz Yisrael for five years. During his stay abroad, he served as a rabbi in London and continued to toil for the Jews of Eretz Yisrael. He firmly supported the Balfour Declaration, which supported the right of the Jewish people to a national home in the land of their forefathers. My father, the rabbi, the Nazir of blessed memory, was Rav Kook's most outstanding disciple and follower. He was in Switzerland, and the leaders of Swiss Jewry arranged a meeting between these two great men. And the Nazir describes how he went to immerse himself in the Rhine River in order to purify himself in preparation for his first meeting with Rav Kook. What forged the bond between them was a melody. He stayed overnight at the home where Rav Kook stayed. Rav Kook's bedroom was in the room directly above his. He lay awake all night in anticipation. And as dawn broke, he heard singing, and the singing was so wonderful, as if the heavens had opened and the angels were singing. At that moment he said that I would be his disciple. In 1919, the gates of Eretz Yisrael reopened and Rav Kook hurried back. He was immediately installed as chief rabbi of Jerusalem. He established the chief rabbinate of Eretz Yisrael which was to unite all the different religious movements under it. As the first chief rabbi of Israel, he was active in the Zionist struggle against the British rule. He did much to preserve the Jewish character of the Jewish settlement in Eretz Israel and fought for the involvement of the British army against the cruel attacks by Arabs. As chief rabbi, he beseeched the mandate government to allow the mass immigration of Jews from the diaspora. When I was a little boy, my father said, I am leaving Hungary. There is no longer any place here for Jews. He would travel a lot, and he heard that there was a place called Eretz Yisrael. He wanted to go there. A layman shall not sit there. The Arabs would bring their goats, and the milkman or milkmaid would deliver the milk. I used to bring milk here to the home of Rav Kook. And so I knew the family, the rabbi. This was the room, was a tiny room. This is where he learned. Here he sat. Here there were books. The door was always open. I stood by the door. I didn't dare disturb him. He was learning. If my memory serves me, he was learning something about agriculture. We can indeed see that Eretz Yisrael gives of its fruits generously. We have an abundance of olives, figs, pomegranates that will soon ripen with great bounty. On the place we are sitting right now, just a few meters from here, there was a battery of artillery that shelled my home in Kibbutz Engev when I was a child. There was nothing here just a few farmers that tilled the land. They never imagined that this small tract of land could yield such an abundance of fruits, of vegetables, of life. That is the sign. After that come many other things. Eretz Yisrael is not something external, a mere means to an end of the general organization and maintenance of its physical or even spiritual existence. Eretz Yisrael is an inalienable entity linked by the bonds of life to the nation and intertwined with the inner characteristics of its existence. Here in Eretz Yisrael at that very same time there was a famine, but everything here was swamps. An Arab woman used to bring from Silwan baskets of her fruit grown in patches 
and the sewage that flowed in Wadi Jaws watered the gardens of those Arabs. Today, no one would eat those fruits. Today, there are trucks, 15 tons, and they empty them. I go to the Machane Yehuda market every day and walk through the whole market, whether I need anything or not, and pass the stalls. The Messiah is here. Here the Divine Spirit will rest. Here will be the language of the Torah. Sing a song, 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 plow a field, field, field. I always remember that as a child. Of all the words I didn't understand, those words. Here Shechina, the Divine Spirit will rest. What's that? Shechina, like Tchina? Or Shechin, a kind of disease? We had no idea what it meant. We didn't know that word. The great idealists were also great heretics. Where did their idealism come from? From the faith that they had in their hearts. And they had faith in their hearts. This is a strange generation. It is rash and wild, but also sublime and exalted. The terrible trials and tribulations have made it tough and bold. So much so that all the fears and horrors do not daunt it. It cannot be made to repent through fear, but it is very much able to repent through love, to which the awe of the sublime may be connected. I was born in Engev. I felt my whole life that I was at the forefront of Zionism, of the important activities of the Jewish people. Afterwards, I was in the army, and perhaps unlike others who got into drugs and other difficulties, that was not the issue with us. For me, after the war, after I saw so many people killed, that's when the questions began. What is this nation? What is this state that they are so worthy, so important that human lives can be endangered so that they can exist? And then I went to Merkaz Harav, and I said to myself, I'm not afraid to ask questions in this place. Thank God. That is God's hand. The teachings of Rav Kook won broad recognition following the establishment of the Central Universal Yeshiva in Jerusalem, known today as Yeshivat Merkaz Rav Kook. Rav Kook wanted to turn the Yeshiva into a unique Jewish spiritual center that would address all the challenges of the generation from halachic rulings on matters of religion and state to the discussion of the inner essence of the Torah and abstract ideas. The subjects that were chosen by Rav Kook to be taught in the yeshiva were very interesting. He wanted to find a person who was familiar with the world of science, but also familiar with the world of the Torah. The Rav, the Nazir, came from the yeshivot of Slobodka and Volozhin, and that is why Rav Kook invited the Nazir to come to Eretz Yisrael. It was a program that, of course, was made up primarily of the study of Talmud, but no less so, Jewish philosophy, and even the disciplines of science were required for a Torah scholar to hand down halachic rulings on practical questions. This kind of personality had not arisen in the Jewish people for many generations. Genius that encompasses all areas of Judaism, Jewish law on the very highest level. He was one of the greatest halachic authorities of the generation. Agada, Kabbalah, philosophy, poetry, originality, a phenomenon the likes of which had not been seen for hundreds of years. One could always hear from him Torah like the flowing of fountains. He was unique in this. This was something truly unique. Rabbis always learn a lot, but the abundance of innovative concepts that his mind came up with, he was unique in this. He was the only one to develop a deep, grand, and comprehensive philosophy of what is known as a dialectic approach meaning that even the contrast, the opposite of the sacred, that is the profane, must lie at the foundation of the sacred. The impure and the pure do not connect, nor the holy and the secular, but there is the matter of sanctifying the profane. So even if there are moments of weakness when the national renewal is not evident, and if in secular people we do not see the sanctity, it's just a matter of time before the full clarity is revealed. To develop all aspects of the nation's strength, that is what the Rav said, to uncover all the different variations, all the phenomena, the moral, cultural, completeness, all as one. These are not two extremes, they are one. It is the very same idea. This recognition was discovered by the Rav, and his disciples continue to develop it. 
My late father used to say that every encounter between the Jewish people and the land of Israel produced a great spiritual creation. The first encounter produced the prophets, the second produced the Mishnah and Talmud, and the third encounter must restore a major significant spiritual creation. The theory of a spiritual, prophetical, religious center in Eretz Yisrael that will unite the Jewish people around it and unite the entire world in the kingdom of God. Our teacher, Rabbi Tzvi Yehuda, who was the son of Rabbi Avraham Yitzchak Cohen Cook, turned the teachings of the Rav, which were his own teachings, which he alone encompassed, into teachings for the many. After the establishment of the state, a great thirst for Torah awakened among the religious Zionist students, until the students met Rav Tzvi Yehuda. After that, the yeshiva began to flourish and grow, because the people capable of taking in the teachings of the Rav had been found. People that lived Eretz Yisrael with the rebirth and revival of the nation, and they wanted to receive all these things from a Torah source. I absorbed his teachings when I was within the holy walls of Yeshivat Merkaz Rav. I took the path of Rav Kook, and I tried to apply it in the daily life of the army. Israeli soldiers are essentially the mirror of the entire Jewish people. However, can one take this broad spectrum of people and connect it to a single common denominator? The work today in Gesher, whose idea was it to unite the Jewish people? From where did this idea come? Who was the greatest of all in this idea? It was Rav Kook. I think that my grandfather's connection to Rav Kook came because he saw this in Rav Kook, and he also knew all the great rabbis of the previous generation and was close to them. But why did he connect so strongly with Rav Kook? He saw not only the figure of the great Torah scholar, but also the man that put that Torah into practice, that lived the Jewish people. I would like to tell you a brief story about the visit by Rav Kook here in 1927. I heard it from two people that accompanied him on that trip. They went into a stable and we were mortified because there were mules there. We didn't want to show the chief rabbi that we harnessed donkeys and horses together, which of course is forbidden by the Torah. Rav Kook saw the donkey. We wanted to bury ourselves in shame. How could the chief rabbi see this terrible sin? But, and this is the special thing, Rav Kook saw what was there, but he also realized how embarrassed they would be if they saw that he had seen this. So he immediately turned his head and made a gesture as if to say, relax, nothing terrible has happened. And when they exited, he clapped them on the shoulder and said, the most important thing is that you're doing the work, settling and redeeming the land. They were deeply impressed by his tolerance and mutual understanding and lack of exaggerated strictness. Rav Kook supported the pioneers who did not observe the commandments. He said that he was willing to embrace them with love. He tried to draw hearts closer among Jews. Today, too, I am sure that if you were alive, he would continue on that same path. He would not curse, abuse, or slander. He would try with pleasant words of love to return the nation to its roots. I left the yeshiva with the understanding that Rav Kook intended that we know how to accept those that are different, that it's all right to be different. Rav Kook saw the importance of everyone, that if one is missing, then there is no unity in the Jewish people. He saw the importance of every individual. Just as when one takes the four species of the Sukkot holiday, people are willing to pay thousands of dollars for a fine etrog, but the Aravot, which cost only pennies, if they're missing, one cannot recite the blessing on the etrog either. One must have them all together. In every single Jew, young and old, the light of the living God in its sacred beauty burns and shines. The ability to see in every Jew a perfected divine phenomenon is the product of a prophetic spark. We now have the possibility of creating integration in order to attain completeness among all the parts of the nation. 
except that sometimes it can be done in a harmonious fashion, as with a couple who, despite their opposing characteristics, can live in harmony. But sometimes it takes a very difficult, almost pathological path, and Rav Kook believed that we can join the two parts of the nation with love. There are always disputes. To unite the Jewish people is also related to the secular people. The most difficult question is how to create ties between us and those Jews that do not believe in the Torah. Normally it is difficult to tolerate this, but difficult or not, they are Jews and we care about them. Rav Kook said that he had no problem loving every Jew. It emerged from the very depths of his soul, like a flowing spring that bursts forth, to love. He saw the greatness in every Jew, man or woman, the potential in every Jew. Today people immediately, the moment they see how someone is dressed, they immediately label him, categorize him. That didn't exist for Rav Kook. He didn't label people. He saw the entire Jewish people unified as one solid piece of gold. I was born and raised on the border with Latvia, where Rav Kook was born. But I began to personally admire him during the blood libel following the Arlazarov murder. In June 1933, while walking along Tel Aviv's beach, Dr. Chaim Arlazarov, a leader of the Labor Party, was murdered. During the investigation, three members of Zev Jabotinsky's revisionist movement were arrested. One, Avram Stavsky, was found guilty and sentenced to death. The Jewish people, not only here, became deeply split. There was terrible hatred for the Jabotinsky movement. One day we were told that Rav Kook had gotten up in the synagogue and before an open Torah scroll declared that he knew for certain that Stavsky had not killed our Lazarov. Rav Kook made the following important statement. Solomon was surely a wise king and gave judgment in many cases that came before him. But the Tanakh tells us of only one case, that of the two women who claimed the same baby. Solomon said, divided in two. The real mother did not want the child divided. But is this just a fable for children? No. Of course not. It is a very serious story, because it was a prophecy, that is, whether or not to divide this country in two. Rav Cook said that the one that is in favor of dividing the people is not the true mother. I think that at a time of tension, like after the Al-Azharov killing, like there may be today at certain times, we must try to maintain the unity of the nation even at the most difficult moments, and not to develop baseless hatred between the different groups. My love for all creatures and for all reality is great. Heaven forbid even a tiny spark of hatred for people enter my heart. I feel in all my being a great love for all people. My father and Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Orbach studied together as children at Yeshivat Eitz Chaim on Jaffa Road. And sometimes on Shabbat they would learn in a Beit Midrash, young children that learned Torah all day. My father and Rav Orbach both told me that sometimes they would close the Gemara and cross Jaffa Road to the home of Rav Kook. They would go upstairs to his home, taking turns for a few moments each, and peek through the keyhole to watch Rav Kook learning. And they said that those few minutes, to see his face radiating with holiness, gave them the desire to return immediately to their studies, to the Gemara, to become great Torah scholars. People simply don't know that Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Orbach, the Gaon, the great halachic authority of Jerusalem, to the end of his days would say, 
the Rav said. To whom was he referring? He was referring to Rav Kook. It's a little difficult to describe the awe that they felt towards Rav Kook. Today people say, Rav Kook this, Rav Kook that. Everyone throws his name around. He would only say, is that his last illness was cancer of the gallbladder. He clearly suffered terribly in Jerusalem. I think he was not understood. Some viewed his affinity for secular people as fraternization with evil people. The fanatical elements of Jerusalem persecuted him. And when he took a stand in favor of Stavsky after Lazarov was murdered, not to allow further bloodshed of Jews or a civil war, the left persecuted him even though the leaders, Beryl Katzenelson, Zaman Shazar and others, admired him. His whole life he was a fighter without wanting to be one. He had his own way and he could be very firm about what he believed in. It was not easy, but what great man does not suffer before his vision is realized. <laughs> We do not understand everything he wrote, but he left us teachings and guidance to help us in our national revival. We, the disciples of Rav Kook, must paint the following horizon, to be the bridgehead to the next horizon. Not only to build a state, roads, not just to dress you in a robe of mortar and cement, but also to build the spiritual level, the level of the Jewish soul in all its strength and glory. And that is a great mission. When the students of Mir Kazarav go to the army, they usually go to the better units. That radiates towards the other soldiers and it means, yes, it's possible and one must, and it is a duty to know how to combine the security challenges facing the state of Israel with the power of the Torah. The privilege I have to stand before a couple of hundred soldiers each week, to speak to them and bring them the message of Judaism as I received it from my father and grandfather in the light of Rav Kook, that we are the Jewish people, the unity of the Jewish people. Rav Kook was a courageous man. I'm not sure we are as courageous, but enough so that we can continue to draw upon and learn from his teachings. We've proved that one can make a radio station and a newspaper that have sanctity, that are on a high level without slander. We've discovered it in industry, in the army, in settlement, and in recent years in the media too. It's just a question of time before it will be in the leadership of Israel as well. There's no doubt about it. For me, one of the things that gives me strength is when at 2 o'clock in the morning I see that there's still lights on in the yeshiva. Thank God. That comforts me. Wherever there are students of the Rav, they spread a light of confidence, of faith, of hope to continue this path to achieve the great goals that lie ahead. A Jew with morals, with good aspirations, 
There are problems and difficulties, but on the other hand, there is also light, and one must connect with the light. That is the message of Rav Kook and his book Orot, Lights. A new light will radiate, and we will say Amen.